Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first of what we hope will become a regular monthly lunchtime talk organised by the 1745 Association on topics of Jacobite interest. This has been a difficult year when, for circumstances beyond our control, we have been unable to organise our usual programme on events. But humans are infinitely adaptable, and when one door closes, another one opens, and the stimulus provided by the COVID lockdown has encouraged us to organise this online event. And hopefully, as we come out of the crisis in 2021, we will be able to combine a monthly online talk with a physical programme of events when we can meet face to face once more. It's particularly appropriate that this inaugural talk is being given in January 2021, as it is 275 years since the tragic and accidental death of the youngest colonel in the Jacobite army of 1745, young Glengarry. And it is equally appropriate that this first talk is being given by Glenn MacDonald, former vice chairman of the association, as it was Glenn who put it in the hard work to successfully organize a plaque to his memory at the entrance to the Trinity Church in Falkirk on Falkirk High Street, where young Glengarry was laid to rest almost three centuries ago. And so it is with great pleasure that I invite Glenn to speak to us today. Thank you very much indeed, Mike, for those um, introductory words and also, thank you to uh, yourself and the association for giving me the opportunity to provide the inaugural talk in the series of talks that uh, you've just described. So many thanks. So the title of my talk today is After the Battle of Falkirk, The Death of Young Glengarry, in which I'm going to tell you an interesting tale about a little cameo event which happened on the fringes of uh, bigger events in connection with the Battle of Falkirk which took place on the 17th of January, 1746. By way of providing some context to the story of the death of young Glengarry, I should perhaps just very briefly um, set the scene by telling you about briefly about the events of the previous day, namely the 17th when the battle took place. It was a battle, of course, between the Hanoverian um, British government forces commanded by General Henry Hawley and the Jacobite army of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, or as we more commonly know him, um, Bonnie Prince Charlie. The battle took place on the high ground to above and to the south of Falkirk, and it took place in uh, the late afternoon and early mid evening. And in fact, it took place in terrible conditions of weather. Um, storms, hail, gales, rain, you name it. It was uh, dreadful weather um, in which to fight a battle. But the, by the end of the day, um, to cut a long story short, the Jacobites prevailed. Um, although it was touch and go here and there, now and again, the Jacobites prevailed and Bonnie Prince Charlie's army was victorious. Um, and uh, the government army of General Hawley um, withdrew in some considerable distress and disarray from the field. It, um, um, the army um, dispersed eastwards towards Linlithgow and on to Edinburgh in, in a state of um, defeat and, and almost panic um, and leaving behind um, uh, their um, artillery, uh, their baggage train um, and um, many of their arms munitions and accoutrements and, and that part of the tale is significant in relation to the story I'm going to now relate to you. So that's the scene set, that's what happened on the day before and Bonnie Prince Charlie's army following the battle occupied the town of Falkirk. But what I'm going to describe to you now is what happened on the day after the battle on the 18th of January 1746. And you can see here a picture of Falkirk painted um, around about this time when <clears throat> Falkirk was um, um, not a, a large town as we would know it today, but probably what we would know today as a, as a, a large village. And that's how it looked at this time. 
and indeed central to that uh, picture you can see two buildings two prominent buildings on the left you've got the old um, trinity old parish church on the high street in falkirk where young glengarry is, is laid to rest and on the right hand side you can see the toll booth with its distinctive tower and it, in fact it is in that location between those two prominent buildings where all of the events that I'm about to describe pretty much took place in that small area you see there. So on the day after the battle and the weather improved, the sun came out, probably still a bit chilly as it tends to be in Scotland at this time of year, but nevertheless, it was a brighter, more cheerier day. And so the soldiers of Bonnie Prince Charlie's army um, got out of uh, wherever they'd been able to find billets the night before, late when they got into Falkirk, no doubt um, in people's houses and went outside, stretched their limbs um, and um, thought about uh, the aftermath of the battle and what it would mean for them. And here's another picture of Falkirk um, illustrated probably a few years after the events I'm going to describe, but nevertheless, um, giving a, a pretty good and accurate depiction of what folk looked like in the mid uh, to late uh, 18th century. And indeed, um, I know folk quite well myself and I can tell you, interestingly, that the high street looks pretty much like that today. Um, obviously there's a different shop frontages, but the, the aspect is remarkably similar to that which you would find were you to be walking the high street today. And this is the locus of where all these events took place. And in the middle there or to the right, you can see the, the toll booth uh, with its tower that I mentioned earlier on. So the, the, the young gentleman who was shot and mor mortally wounded, young Glengarry, was walking along the high street on the right hand side of the picture there on the south side of the street. And on the opposite side of the street, you can see some buildings there on the north side. And as young Glengarry was walking along the street on the left hand side, from one of those upper windows, a musket appeared from out of the window and fired. The musket ball that came from the barrel shot across and downwards over to the other side of the street and struck young Glengarry in his upper torso through his back, damaging his spine. And as we will see, resulted ultimately in his death. He was mortally wounded and fell there and then. Um, and th those are the bold facts of what happened, but there's a much wider story to tell about this, but it happened right there um, in that street, as you can see there. First of all, though, before I go on to describe the wider circumstances surrounding that shooting and its implications, we must perhaps, first of all, think about who young Glengarry was and why it was important. Well, his actual title was Colonel Aeneas MacDonnell of Glengarry, known as Young Glengarry. He was, in fact, the youngest colonel in the Jacobite army of Bonnie Prince Charlie. He was the second son of John, known as Old Glengarry, 12th chief of the MacDonnells of Glengarry. He was 20 years old. Um, and um, as you'll see there in the third bullet point, he was commanding the Glengarry Regiment. Why was he commanding the Glengarry Regiment? Well, first of all, his father, old Glengarry, as his name would suggest, um, was really too old and infirm to be bearing the, the hardships of military campaigning. And so, um, as would normally be the case with clan chiefs in this time and before this time, they would um, delegate command of the clan regiment to normally um, their oldest son. In this case, the older brother, the oldest son, as you see in the second bullet there, was Alistair Ruag MacGoyle, or in English, um, red-haired Alistair MacDonnell. He, in fact, however, like, uh, as was quite common amongst the Jacobite clan gentry of the time, he had been, he'd spent quite a bit of time in France and was in France um, when the rising occurred. He was serving in a unit of the French army, um, staffed uh, by, mostly by Scots in the Royal Écossais, which had been formed a year or two earlier in anticipation of a Jacobite rising in, in Scotland. So the, old, the oldest son was abroad in France at the time. In fact, he had 
been back to Scotland earlier in 1745 on a secret mission to warn the clan chiefs that uh, there was to be a rising and he'd come back to France. But after the rising started, um, his regiment was um, sent by sea to Scotland to join the rising, but um, alas, um, it was intercepted at sea by the Royal Navy in December 1745, and the soldiers of the regiment were taken prisoner, including the older brother, uh, Alistair Ruig, and he, in fact, was imprisoned in the Tower of London for the remainder of the campaign. In fact, interestingly, after the rising um, uh, came to an end after the Battle of Culloden. Um, many of the clan chiefs and principal people were arrested by the government. Old Glengarry was one of them, and he joined his oldest son in the Tower of London in captivity for a time. So that's why young Glengarry, who was on the face of it only 20 years old, found himself at that young age in a position of great responsibility, commanding his father's um, clan regiment in the army of Bonnie Prince Charlie. The slide says there he was 20 years old, but in fact I've seen some evidence recently to suggest that he might have been a little bit older than that, as he might have been born in 1719, which would put him at 25 maybe or thereabouts. Interestingly, about the same age as Bonnie Prince Charlie himself. Um, um, in any event, we know him to be a young man, 20 to 25 years old. He was married and had a son uh, who had, was born in 1745, uh, an infant with, with the name of Duncan, and we know that Duncan went on actually some years later as a young man himself to become the 14th chief of the Macdonnells of Glengarry in succession to his uncle Alistair Ruick. So that's his kind of background. He, um, the, the Glen, Glengarry regiment had been raised by um, Donald um, MacDonnell of Loch Garry, who was the, the chief's um, cousin, but titular command had been given at the start of the rising to, to young Glengarry. Um, the regiment had um, uh, joined the prince and come south and it fought at the Battle of Preston Pans and young Glengarry commanded the regiment at that battle and by all accounts commanded it well, acquitted himself well, um, despite his youth and inexperience, um, he was a well-respected, very young commanding officer of the regiment, supported, of course, by other clan gentry in the regiment's officer corps. Following Preston Pans, he and another of his kinsmen, um, Cole MacDonald of Bowersdale, were, uh, uh, went back up into the Highlands in order to um, raise more men, to recruit more men, um, in the clan lands of Glengarry and further west in order to uh, further augment Bonnie Prince Charlie's army with the provision of a second battalion of Glengarry MacDonnells and indeed they did do that and um, after the regiment returned to Scotland following the army's um, um, uh, procession down to Derby and the events that took place there and the retreat from Derby via Carlisle and Glasgow etc. When the army came back to central Scotland, young Glengarry joined the regiment again and formed it into two battalions and took command again. One battalion being commanded by Donald MacDonnell of Loch Garry, the chief's cousin, and the second battalion commanded by Cole MacDonald of Barrasdale, a very interesting character in his own right, actually. Um, in fact, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, he was uh, a bit of a crook, and nowadays we'd call him a bit of a mafia boss. He ran a blackmail and protection racket in on the west coast of Scotland in the Western Highlands, um, and uh, was a bit of a shady character, um, and uh, subsequently was arrested, actually, after the rising by the Jacobites when he fled to France. Um, so a bit of a turncoat and um, uh, an interesting character in his own right. I've been to his house, actually, on the shores of Kinloch Hoorn, where he um, maintained um, a, an imprisonment type of machine in the form of stocks to put people into um, when the tide lapped about their um, necks um, in, for those that had um, um, aroused his dislike. So quite an interesting character. So. Um, 
the regiment was formed, as I say, into two battalions and was up to 12,000 strong. In fact, some reports I've read indicate that, in fact, there were 1,500 men in the regiment within these two battalions. So worth making the point that it was a significant uh, unit of, of considerable size within the battle order of Bonnie Prince Charlie's army, which was maybe about eight, eight and a half thousand strong at the Battle of Falkirk. The 1,200 to 1,500 is significant. Perhaps even more significant when you consider that... Um, they formed an even greater proportion of the front line of the Jacobite army, the shock troops, um, mostly the Highland clan regiments who um, unleashed the, the fabled and famous Highland charge upon enemies. And they did it indeed in that day um, with the McDonald's, uh, various regiments of McDonald's on the right of the line of battle as was their, as was their right. So a significant unit um, of some considerable military significance within Bonnie Prince Charlie's army, commanded by this very young, 20 or so years old young man, um, Colonel Aeneas MacDonnell of Glengarry. So how did the shooting of him in the day in the street on the day after the battle come about? Well, in the wake of the battle, um, uh, as I mentioned, Hawley's troops pretty much abandoned their accoutrements and weapons, or many of them did, as they fled in disarray eastwards towards Edinburgh. And they abandoned many of their weapons. And many of them, of course, as you would imagine, were picked up um, and, and taken as spoils of war um, by uh, the Jacobite army. And um, one such um, incident was that a clansman in the Macdonald of Clan Rent Clan Ranald Regiment, think about him as this man you see in the right of your picture here, typically in 18th century Highland um, dress. He had captured a government musket the day before as a spoil of war. And he'd taken it with him into Falkirk late that night after the battle, found himself some lodgings just off the high street, had got his head down. And in the morning when he um, woke up, got himself going like many other Jacobite soldiers that morning, he got up and got on with uh, his day. And his day consisted of, to start with, making safe what he thought um, was um, uh, making safe the musket that he had captured. So the musket in question was the Brown Bess, standard pattern um, musket uh, weapon issued to soldiers in the British Army at this time, and indeed for many years after this. The Brown Bess, it looked like this with a flintlock like that. And it fired a musket ball like this, as you see between the grubby um, finger and thumb, forefinger and thumb on that photograph on the right. It's a 0.75 caliber um, musket ball or in, in new money, 19 millimeters, and uh, does considerable damage to people when, um, uh, when struck within about 100 yards or 110 yards of this weapon, which was uh, more or less its effective range. So this Clan Ranald uh, soldier had a weapon such as this. He'd taken it the day before and he found that it was loaded. So the first thing to do was, as we say, to make the weapon safe. And he did that by extracting with a tool, special tool, the, the musket ball from the barrel. Thinking that the weapon was now safe, i.e. not loaded, um, he pointed it out of the window and into the street. He then pulled the trigger in order to, as he thought, to harmlessly discharge the weapon of, of its wadding and gunpowder, which he thought was the only thing left down there in the barrel. And, and that would be quite a normal thing to do, although you would normally point it in a safe direction just in case. But he didn't. He just thrust the weapon out of the window into the street and pulled the trigger thinking that it would just be the, 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 the warding and gunpowder. But to his great surprise and horror, there was an unexpected recoil, which he felt sharply in his right shoulder. And a second ball, which had been in the barrel, was shot into the street, um, uh, propelled across to the other side of the street and downwards and struck young Glengarry, um, mortally wounding him, struck him in the upper torso and uh, went through his spine by all accounts um, and, and gave him significant injuries of which he eventually passed away. 
He'd been walking on the other side of the street, as I mentioned, with other officers. In short, the musket had been double shotted and the Clan Ranald private soldier had not realized that. Now, there could be a couple of explanations as to why it was double shotted. I mean, it would be normal just to have one musket ball in the weapon um, and to load it with one ball for firing. But on occasions, I understand two musket balls were um, rammed into the barrel, perhaps if it was to be used at shorter range in order to increase the likelihood of the shooter actually hitting a target with at least one of the balls. Um, but perhaps a more likely explanation has been given to um, our uh, association, has been given by our association member, Paul MacDonald, who's uh, an 18th century weapons um, expert. And he has explained to us that in all likelihood, um, it had been loaded with a second ball by mistake. Quite often, as you can imagine, soldiers in the British Army firing under orders, i.e. not firing at will, but firing in unison with each other on the orders of their NCOs and officers. And um, it may be that because the day before the battle was fought in very wet conditions, that the mechanism, the cocking mechanism and, 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 and um, touch hole of the weapon to, to put the spark through into the powder had got damp, clogged with water or hail or something. Um, and that when the trigger had been pulled the day before, it hadn't actually discharged, but because soldiers either side uh, had discharged their weapons, there was a cacophony of noise. The soldier holding this particular weapon may not have realized that it hadn't actually discharged in the heat of the moment with noise, etc. And he probably reloaded the weapon thinking that there wasn't a ball in it and there were two. Perhaps it misfired again, but for whatever reason, it was left on the battlefield in that state with two balls picked up by the Clan Ranald um, soldier and taken down into Falkirk, but only one of the musket balls had been extracted. So what happened then? Well, young Glengarry obviously dropped, um, having been um, uh, shot through the torso. Um, he was carried by his fellow officers to his lodgings in Burns Court, which is a little, which was a little courtyard just behind and off the south side of the high street on the right hand side of the picture I showed you earlier on. And here in front of you is a photograph taken of Burns Court, obviously later on in the, sometime in the 19th century. And it is perhaps likely that young Glengarry was taken to one of these two buildings, which would certainly have been there in the 18th century. And he was taken into one of these buildings in order to be tended to. Um, so he was taken in there. In fact, interestingly, the site of Burns Court is now encapsulated within the footprint of Marks and Spencers in Falkirk on the south um, side of the high street, as you can see there, but, but things move on, things change. And, 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 and since uh, in the recent years, Marks and Spencers itself has closed in Falkirk, but Burns Court was in there. So, what happened then? Well, whilst Glengarry was being taken to um, his lodgings in Burns Court, the McDonald's of Glengarry gathered in the street um, and um, word quickly spread that their young commanding officer, uh, their chief's second son, had been shot in the street um, and they became angry and agitated and um, a number of them dashed up the stairs in this building where the soldier had fired the shot from and laid hands on him and no doubt gave him a rough time of it, dragged him into the street um, and were outraged that this, um, this um, officer, this soldier from a sister regiment had, um, as they perhaps saw it in the heat of the moment, attempted to murder their commanding officer and they demanded eye for an eye justice. They demanded the right to take him away there and then and execute him for his deed as the perpetrator of the shooting. So in the meantime, the soldier's commanding officer, who wasn't in fact Clan Ranald himself, it was Clan Ranald's eldest son, who um, was commanding the Clan Ranald regiment. He was called for and came with some of his clansmen and a bit of an uproar took place, you know, a, a, a bit of a dilemma ensued and it rapidly became apparent to 
um, Clan Ranald, that he was on the horns of a dilemma. Why? Because if he permitted his clansmen to be dragged away by clansmen of another clan, albeit another clan, Donald clan, and summarily executed, then that would be seen as an insult to his clan and regiment, bearing in mind that the man had not been given any kind of a trial to see what had actually happened. So he thought it would be an affront and an insult to him, his clan and his regiment, if they were allowed to do that. On the other hand, if they if he didn't allow them to do that, then the MacDonnells of Glengarry would be incensed and irked in the extreme and annoyed and disaffected to such an extent that they, um, the heart would go out of their efforts in support of Bonnie Prince Charlie's army and they may um, withdraw from the army to, and, and removing a significant portion of its fighting strength. It was a real dilemma. Um, Bonnie Prince Charlie and his staff became involved as well, um, and um, um, deliberations were undertaken as to how best to resolve this situation. But in the end, a compromise was struck that was believed that it was believed would um, give due honour to all parties um, and ensure that the matter could be put to rest without either of these two clans being totally disaffected. And the compromise was that, yes, he, he would be executed for perpetrating this deed, whether it was accidental or not, but that the Clan Ranald would execute him themselves. So Clan Ranald formed a firing squad, the depiction of, of which you can see here, uh, depicted by reenactors. The man was taken to um, a place called the Cladden's Wall um, um, in the in the major estate calendar house at the edge of the town, which incidentally was belonged of the Earl of Kilmarnock, who was also a senior officer in Bonnie Prince Charlie's army. Coincidentally, uh, the man was taken there. A firing squad was formed, and interestingly, the firing squad contained one particular. Clan Ranald Highlander, let's call him this man you see on the right here, who's another reenactor. Um, and this was the man who was to be executed's father, would you believe? And this man, the soldier's father, wanted to be part of the firing squad, which was tasked with executing his own son because he wanted to ensure that if he had, if he had to die, his son would die instantly and he would make sure of it. What, what a dreadful thing for any father to have to do, but did it, he, di he did that um, and the man was executed. So where did that leave the situation in young Glengarry? Well, having been initially attended by the regimental surgeons, young Glengarry lay in agony in his lodgings for two, three days, exactly how many days and nights, we're not entirely sure, but. Rough, love, roughly three days, in great pain, and it seems that it, in, in terms of the, the, you know, nowadays as, as a battlefield injury, he probably could have been saved, but the, the extent of, of, of medical capability at, at the time was such that his injury was too serious and, and not much could be done for him other than to keep him comfortable, tend his wound, etc., um, and see um, whether he recovered. But in fact, he was for a time lucid and compass mentis and um, much and greatly to his credit on hearing about the plight of the clan Ranald man who had accidentally shot him. He had declared himself satisfied that the man was innocent and very commendably and honorably and magnanimously asked that no harm should come to him. But as we've seen, you know, with the Glengarry men, the red mist had come up for them and, and they demanded justice. And uh, we have seen that um, eventually Clan Ranald's men executed the shooter themselves. Eventually, after three painful days and nights, <clears throat> young Glengarry passed away on the, around about the 21st or 22nd of January, 1746, in his lodgings in Burns Court. Now, I think the important thing to do now is to consider these events in a wider context 
and consider what the ramifications were. And in order to understand the ramifications, I think we have to consider what was going on in terms of the wider strategic picture with Bonnie Prince Charlie's army and rising in general at that time. So the context here is that in the immediate wake of the Battle of Falkirk, the Jacobite High Command was divided into two camps, eventually geographically, because Bonnie Prince Charlie and his staff went to Bannockburn House near Stirling and the, the rump of the army, along with its operational command, Lord George Murray and the Highland Chiefs and, and, and regimental commanding officers in, in Falkirk, it settled that way. Initially, though, after the battle, Lord George Murray and the, the commanding officers, the senior officers, wanted to press their advantage, having won this battle. They wanted to pursue warfare of speed and manoeuvre. They wanted to pursue the fleeing remnants of Hawley's army through Falkirk, through Linlithgow, um, uh, um, capturing um, uh, their capturing uh, prisoners um, and ensuring that the army couldn't reform and above all, retaking Edinburgh, retaking Scotland's capital um, to gain some strategic advantage out of the battle that they just won which seems entirely sensible and reasonable. On the other hand, the Prince's party and his staff saw things differently. Um, they didn't initially want to undertake uh, the course of action I've just explained because they wanted the army to remain in and around Falkirk, Stirling area in order to <clears throat> proceed with the siege of Stirling Castle, which had been under, underway for some time before the battle. And the thinking being that strategic that Stirling Castle was a strategic place and, and feature which should be captured and surrendered so that it didn't hinder their connections um, um, and passage of men and resources up to the north of Scotland and the, and the Highlands, which at the time was their, their power base. Um, although the other side of the command felt that that was really unnecessary and that Stirling Castle could simply be bypassed and that, um, you know, as long as the army kept out of the artillery range from the castle, then it could do no real harm. Um, so it, it was decided that the army would stay and do that and continue with the siege of Stirling Castle uh, under a French engineer that um, they had working with them. Meantime, in Falkirk, the army was um, becoming a bit restive for quite a few days whilst it, um, whilst it frankly hung about Falkirk. And importantly, the town of Falkirk and its immediate hinterland and environment, it rapidly became apparent that it couldn't really support, you know, um, six to 8,000 men billeted on what was really a large village. You know, there just wasn't enough accommodation, um, um, shelter, food, drink, um, to support such a large army. And, and that meant that, quite frankly, um, you know, uh, the, the, the lower echelons of the army were going hungry. Um, not only that, they felt that in, in hanging about in a place where they weren't be able, could not get proper support, they'd lost impetus and they lost um, momentum. And, and in many ways, um, the army began to lose heart. And that manifest itself in the form of increasing desertions. Increasingly, large numbers of men were slipping away northwards through the night to desert the army um, and return to their clan lands um, with perhaps what, whatever booty they'd managed to um, acquire during the course of that date. So uh, the army was beginning to atrophy and, and lose heart, lose momentum, lose fighting spirit. In the meantime, crucially, Lord George Murray was getting intelligence from Edinburgh that the opposite was happening to Hawley's government army. It was gaining in strength. It was reforming itself. It was using the resources available to it in Edinburgh to, um, to um, uh, rearm itself, to, um, to feed itself, to reform itself, to regain its composure. Um, additional units came up from the south to augment the size of the army. Stragglers came back in that had been missing over the last period and reformed their 
it reformed into their units. Um, they started drilling again. They started regaining confidence. Not only that, the Duke of Cumberland, the king's son, um, um, came north and um, joined the government army on the 30th of January to take command from Hawley. And he was a well-respected um, uh, officer in the government army, um, much liked by the common soldier. And that would have given a shot in the arm to the confidence and, and spirit that um, was abounding in the government army as it, as it regained its confidence and strength in Edinburgh. And it, it, it didn't need um, anybody with a great brain to realize that sooner or later that government army would move westwards again to confront the Jacobites. But in the meantime, the Jacobites were in a declining position, as I have suggested. So this greatly con con concerned Lord George Murray and the senior officers around him. And um, this resulted in a very bad tempered exchange of missives between them on the one hand and Bonnie Prince Charlie in Bannockburn House on the other and an exchange of emissaries was sent back and forth to debate um, what exactly should be done and um, eventually Lord George Murray and the Highland Chiefs and, and the principal commanding officers recommended that the army because of its state should retreat northwards into the Highlands to regroup for the remainder of the winter and indeed that is exactly what happened um, in, a, in a somewhat ragged way on the fringes of proper command and control the army eventually bolted north to the fords of Frew and, and northwards. So that, that was the wider picture that was unfolding in these days after the battle, um, uh, in the period between which um, young Glengarry was shot and uh, he eventually died and, and the ill feeling that that generated. So what, it, what, what um, effect did this little cameo incident have upon that wider strategic picture that I've just described to you? Well, the ramifications were, first of all, that young Glengarry's death stood divisions between the two Clan Donald regiments, two significant units at the, the, the teeth fighting edge of the force, and, and fueled a deterioration in, in morale and contributed towards desertions. You know, perhaps worth bearing in mind, you know, that, um, um, you know, that, 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 that clan regiments um, didn't just have a commanding officer, they had either their clan chief or um, one of his one of his principal sons, and there was a great feeling of affinity for it, it, not in all cases, but but certainly amongst the officer corps. And having lost their commanding officer, they were dispirited and began to desert in increasing numbers. On top of for the reasons I've just described, also many refused to believe that the shooting was an accident. You know, conspiracy theories, you know, abounded up and down the high street in Falkirk in the Gallic tongue to the. Um, to the suggestion that he'd actually been deliberately murdered and people were wondering why he'd been murdered. You know, this was a scene of subterfuge and, and ill feeling um, abroad following his shooting. But as we've seen, um, young Glengarry eventually passed away on 22nd of January um, and he was laid to rest. And I'm going to show you shortly where he was laid to rest um, in um, the uh, graveyard in the ch churchyard of uh, Trinity Old Parish Church in Falkirk and um, a, 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 a funeral was held for him. Um, Lord George Murray and all of the clan chiefs and commanding officers and senior officers um, of the army attended the funeral but we know that Bonnie Prince Charlie did not attend the funeral. Um, he failed to attend and that was seen as a considerable snub by the clan chiefs who were greatly um, um, affected by, by that and thought it was a disgrace that Bonnie Prince Charlie had not attended. And so that contributed towards the feeling of ill will towards the prince and his staff. In fact, we know that Bonnie Prince Charlie was, was ill at the time. Um, he was laid up in bed with something like a very bad cold or flu or pneumonia, something like that. We'll never know exactly what he was suffering from, but it was something of that nature. To what extent he was ill, we don't know. He was being tended by the woman that eventually went on in later years to become his mistress, Clementina Walkinshaw, who I think was the daughter of the, the, the owner of Bannockburn House. Now, I think, and this is just my own personal opinion, that 
if he was well enough to attend, notwithstanding the fact that he had a terrible cold, um, if that was the case, then I think if he'd been in of a right mind, he would have realised that, in fact, it was in his best interest to attend in order to ensure the co cohesion of, of his army. But whatever reason, he didn't attend. And I think that contributed greatly towards the feeling of unhappiness amongst the army and the division between the two camps. In a way, therefore, I think the death of young Glengarry and its aftermath contributed towards the eventual decision for the Jacobite army to retreat north into the highlands. Um, and that, that was a significant strategic event in the history of the rising, the retreat north into the highlands rather than to remain in the central belt. And perhaps arguably um, was, you know, perhaps eventually led to um, the way in which the, the rising came to an end and the situation the army found itself in at Culloden, etc. And um, although young Glengarry's death wasn't the linchpin driving force behind what happened, I think um, it played a significant part in those wider um, um, proceedings that led to this situation. So I, I would I'd say that this is a significant um, event in the wider context, even although on the face of it, it's a small cameo incident that happened the day after the battle. So an interesting debate. So where was young Glengarry laid to rest? Well, he was laid to rest in that sarcophagus that you see in the photograph on the left-hand side of your picture there um, in, the, in the churchyard of Falkirk Trinity Old Parish Church. Um, the wrought iron work you can see around it, I think was erected in later years, but you'll see within it a stone sarcophagus. Um, and young Glengarry was put in there. But in fact, um, that's not his grave. It is the tomb of John de Graham, one of Robert the Bruce's lieutenants, who was killed during the earlier Battle of Falkirk, uh, many, many centuries beforehand, um, and um, was opened up in order for young Glengarry to be buried within it, where he lies to this day. Now, I knew the story that I've just described to you quite well. Um, uh, I visit folk fairly regularly and I was in the town one day and um, I was on the high street and I thought to myself, well, you know, young Glengarry was shot here. The man who shot him was out of one of these windows on this side of the street here. He was taken to Burns Court in Marks and Spencers um, and he died three days later and he was buried here in this grave um, on the other side, behind the other side of the high street here. And all of those things happened within a circumference of about 100 or 150 yards. And I looked around and I thought, there's nothing here, no information board, no leaflets, nothing on any wall to indicate that these important events took place in this very ancient town, in this vicinity. And neither, more importantly and more sadly, was there anything to say that young Glengarry is buried in that sarcophagus? And I thought to myself, the 1745 Association really should do something about this. We really should mark this. And I took it upon myself to try and make that happen. Um, because after all, one of the aims of the association is to mark um, sites of interest historical interest in relation to the Jacobite rising of 1745-46. And this story surely and certainly is, is one of those. So I, I spoke to um, Mike Niven, our chairman, who you uh, heard from earlier on and um, suggested this to him and he was very supportive. And we took a proposal to the council of the association and they readily saw the, the, the desirability of this and funds were allocated. And I set about the task of trying to achieve it. Well, it did take me quite some time. In fact, to cut a very long story short, it took me two years. I had to contact um, and find out who owned various buildings in the area to try and see whether we could erect a plaque. There, there was planning permission um, and red tape to be, to be gone through. Um, the plaque was manufactured uh, and had to go back because there was an error on it. Um, all sorts of mishaps 
um, blind alleyways and, and rabbit holes had to be negotiated. But eventually um, it, it, it was achieved um, and, and uh, um, a plaque was erected um, in January of uh, 2018, two years ago, and here it is here. Um, and um, you can see here on the right, a picture of where the plaque is placed. It's um, erected on the buttress of that medieval archway that you can see. And the medieval archway gives access to the churchyard where Glengarry is buried. And, and, and that's a very recent photograph, actually. I took that uh, a month, couple of months ago. And I'm pleased to see that the archway has been um, significantly restored um, by Falkirk District Council lately. It was in a crumbling state when we erected the, the, the plaque. And interesting for me to reflect on, upon the, the fact that through that archway and in that gateway you see there would have gone Lord George Murray and all the Highland chiefs that day to attend young Glengarry's funeral. They would have all trooped through there for a service in the church and to see him interred in that sarcophagus I have, I have shown you. So very appropriate that it's there and it's just a, a few yards down the road from where he was, where he was shot, um, um, where the shooter was and, and, and where he eventually died in Burns Court. So we managed to achieve it and the, the detail of the plaque is as you can see on your left hand photograph there. The motif at the top is the, the, the clan motif of um, the clan motif and motto of the MacDonnells of Glengarry, which bears um, words in, in Gaelic at the top, which means the rock of the raven. And I, I, I just sum up and read for you what our plaque says. The death of young Glengarry, near the spot on the 18th of January, 1746, Colonel Aeneas MacDonnell, known as young Glengarry, second son of John, 12th chief of the Macdonalds of Glengarry was shot and seriously injured by the accidental discharge of a musket captured the previous day during the Battle of Falkirk, fought between the victorious Jacobite army of Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Hanoverian government forces of King George II. Young Glengarry, who'd commanded the Macdonald clan regiment on behalf of his father during the Rising, died three days later in his lodgings across the street in what was once Burns Court and was buried here in the Trinity Old Parish Churchyard within the wrought iron sarcophagus of Sir John de Graham, erected by the 1745 Association in 2018. So um, we had achieved it at long last, and we'd done two things. We had provided some record in the town centre of what actually happened that day and why it was important. And secondly, um, we had provided some commemoration um, for young Glengarry to say that he is buried um, very close to this plaque um, so that his name appears in a way that he doesn't, that it doesn't on the sarcophagus. So we were delighted to have achieved that and we were delighted to arrange uh, a special unveiling day um, for the plaque and here are some photographs from it and we were delighted and, and indeed honoured that Ranald MacDonnell of Glengarry the current day 23rd chief of the MacDonnells of Glengarry readily and happily agreed to unveil the plaque for us and indeed to lay a grave, uh, lay a wreath at the grave of young Glengarry on Saturday the 20th of January 2018. We had a superb day which started with a couple of presentations in the church hall, one given by Mike Niven about the Battle of Falkirk and a, and a subsequent um, presentation by myself about the death of young Glengarry. Um, we then proceeded out um, to the front of the church um, where the plaque was then covered. And you can see there Glengarry himself, along with his good lady wife, Caroline, Lady Glengarry. Glengarry then unveiled the plaque officially for us and gave a very moving, poignant, appropriate and solemn speech to mark the occasion um, and to thank the 1745 Association for all its efforts to do so. Um, we also had a, a service of commemoration by the association's honorary chaplain, the Reverend Bob Harley, and um, also Glengarry then moved into the church yard, and as you can see at the bottom there, laid a wreath at the sarcophagus of uh, Sir John de Graham, and of course because it was the grave 
of young Glengarry. Very appropriate for the current chief to be doing this because of course, not only is he the current day chief of this clan, but also of course, by dint of his very well recorded lineage, he is of course, a direct descendant of young Glengarry that died 275 years ago in this place. And then finally, if you look at the photograph on the right hand side there, along with Glengarry and Lady Glengarry and my own ugly mug there in the middle next to the plaque, you can see that we had a piper present and appropriately enough, his name is Sandy MacDonnell and he piped for us a tremendous and, and, and very moving pibroch to um, lend additional credence and gravitas to the proceedings and he did that beautifully and hauntingly and that topped off the proceedings extremely well. So ladies and gentlemen that completes the tale, the story behind um, one, just one of the many plaques and cairns erected by the 1745 Association. I hope that you have enjoyed hearing about this story and found it interesting. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.